Hi, I'm Joe Johnson, and I'm the senior pastor here at Goffstown Harvest Christian Church, and I'm glad you're checking out our program, which we call His Kingdom Now. You know, when Jesus walked on the earth, He was clear. He didn't come to bring another religion. He came to open up a relationship with God through the kingdom of heaven. And the most amazing news about this is we have access to that kingdom just as much as He does. And so what we're going to do today as we open up the Word of God is we're going to find out how the stuff works. We're going to learn what He said, how to cooperate with His kingdom, so that all of us can walk with God and see amazing things, not just in this generation, but we can know for sure that we can live with Him forever and ever. So enjoy the service. I look forward to talking to you at the end. We want to welcome you to uh, our Family Values Month. And as I was watching that, you know, bringing back all those uh, memories and how we've grown up together. And, um, you know, the Johnson family is still very, we're very close. And uh, I believe that that's a result of God's grace. But God's grace is always available. It doesn't mean you necessarily know how to take advantage of it. I learned how to take advantage of it. There's a science to learning how to cooperate with the goodness of God and His promises, and especially for, his, for our children and for our families. And so, again, I'm just very blessed. I'm very thankful. Um, last week, I thought we just had a really great start uh, to the series. I know there were a couple folks who's just like, well, I wish you would have spent maybe a little bit more time on families. That's all I was talking about was families last week. And I would actually suggest that you go back and watch it again. And what I wanted to do, I'm just going to review very shortly because we got a lot, of, a lot to cover today. But what I really wanted to do was set the stage so that when I quote, most of you, if you've been around Jesus any amount of time, I'm going to quote verses. You're going to go, yeah, I know that verse. Uh, yeah, I know I'm supposed to do that. Well, to many of us, and admittedly to our teenagers and our young adults, the scriptures many times can seem like just uh, arbitrary, random. Okay, I've heard that verse, but what does that have to do with me? Why is it going to be so important to listen to what the scriptures, what the word of God has to say? And we talked about a number of things. First of all, again, how many of you... And I'll let you raise your hand. How many of you every day read 1 Corinthians 15? Okay, about 5%. And I want to, and remember the, the illustration I gave was before someone exercises, what you do is you warm up. And you don't go for your max bench on your first set. You don't do that. And I encouraged everybody, and please, let's see 100% hands next week, is at least spend this month going through 1 Corinthians 15, where the Apostle Paul, remember, this was a fella that persecuted the church to the point of he killed some of these people. Okay, He was a zealous Jewish Pharisee that saw Christianity and the message of Jesus being God as such blasphemy it was actually worth taking people's lives. Well, things change when you're on the way to another city to take people out and Jesus personally shows up and knocks you off your donkey and says, you and I, uh, we got to talk. And he presents in 1 Corinthians 15, listen, understand, this is a man that presented a case, first of all, gazillions of eyewitness accounts. And at one point, even 500, over 500 people at a time seeing him. Paul saw him. The apostle Paul, through his writings, he said, look, if the resurrection's not true, why am I suffering such persecution? For one example, when Jesus was, when he was crucified, what'd they do to him before he was crucified? Yeah, 39 stripes, right? Paul beat him two more times. Paul had that happen three times. Lord only had that happen one time. Paul had it three times. And he submitted, if this isn't real, why am I putting up with this? And he submitted in 1 Corinthians 15 and in the, uh, presents the argument that our faith is a waste of time. We're to be pitied if there's no such thing as a resurrection. And what makes this worse is that all of us that are preaching this gospel... 
we're lying to you. You couldn't possibly call us good people if this isn't real. And so the reason why it's going to be important to warm up with that every, you should do it regularly, but at least in the month, because the world wants to pull this into a religious argument, not a this is the way it is statement of fact because of the resurrection. And we don't, if we don't settle that in our hearts, we'll always have, we'll entertain ideas like, well, you know, the script, it's just, it's cultural. Not if Jesus was raised from the dead, it's not cultural. It has absolutely nothing to do with culture. It has everything to do with heaven, pulled back the window and said, this is the way it's going to work for like ever. Start learning these things now. Well, and, and I've had a few of you come up to me, and I'm, and I'm really glad, and the, and the more this gets into your heart when I made the statement, right now, our Father is not looking down from heaven and going, look at all my Christians. He's not thinking in those terms. He's not thinking, wow, look at how all these Christians are worshiping me. No, he goes, there's my children. There's my sons, there's my daughters, and that person next to you is your brother and sister, not a fellow congregant or parishioner. And as we begin to filter and focus our relationship with him and through, uh, with each other through these things, it will dramatically not just change how uh, we interact with one another, but now the Word of God, when he talks about marriage and relationships and activities and things you do, things you don't do, now once the resurrection is settled, you go, you know what, Paul, I can't argue with you. You had to have seen them. And they all, and remember, all of the writers continually appeal to the resurrection as the foundation for what they taught. They would not go a two sentences almost without bringing up, we saw the resurrected Lord, who's now God. And it's imperative that when we look at the Word of God, and we're certainly going to, I mean, I have no filter today. No filter we're just going to have a discussion in the Word of God. But now, because of last week, we were able to establish, we've got to pay attention to this because there are forces, visible and invisible forces, that want to do everything they can to come against not, some, not just our faith in God, but certainly our activities and our moralities that are a result of that. And that includes male-female relationships, marriages, and so on. What I want to do, it's just, uh, again, I, I promise you it's going to be a very short review because we got a lot uh, that I want us to cover today. Okay, today we're going to call today Family Values Week 2, Healing the Pain of the Broken Heart. And I guess if you want to simplify, we could simplify the title and just call it Pain. Now, we're going to quote a verse later. How many of you all are familiar uh, with... Uh, actually, there's two places this verse is found when it comes to Jesus and, and people with broken hearts. Can you tell me where we find that? In the New Testament, or the new technology, which is the term I like to use, where do we find the statements about what Jesus does with broken hearts? Okay, Luke chapter 4. Okay, he was in his hometown, he opens up the scrolls, and he quotes out of the prophet... Isaiah chapter 61, that's right. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to go from, we got one coin, two sides, after a quick review. I've got a, uh, I got a question. How can you know if something's broken if you don't know what it's supposed to look like when it's working right? And what I want to do today is we're going to discover what it is that God has said, this is what it's like when it's right, when it's not broke. And, what, and, and this is going to be really beneficial to us because, again, there's healing in the room, and I'm going to, the reason why we took up everything, uh, did everything first, announcements and offering, is we are praying for people today. Everyone. You're not leaving here today without being prayed for. Because there's no, and I'm not here to prophesy over you. The word of God's going to do enough talking. They'll probably be very quick, my Robin and myself, uh, Christian and Lacey, and we're just going to lay hands on you. There is healing in this room because I'm, I know, because I've been doing this for a long time, and by, oh, let's just get this out of the way too. I want you to say, say this with me. Say out loud. Say, Pastor Joe, Pastor Joe. I know you're a sinner. All right, we got that out of the way. 
but thank God for his grace. And actually, I'm going to clarify because you go, well, how dare you quote that and judge me? Hey, let's just get this out of the way right now. And you will hear, and I will put a slight correction to this, you'll hear folks say, well, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. That's the biggest, fattest lie you could believe. There's a religious devil all over if you believe that. You are not a sinner saved by grace. You were a sinner that had to be saved by grace, but now you are a son of the Most High God. Don't ever say again, oh, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. No, you're not. You're, you're ignorant of New Testament, New, new uh, Covenant new technology realities. I am not a sinner saved by grace. I was a sinner. I had to be saved by grace. I have forgiveness by grace, but I am a son of the most high God. Okay. So now that we've got that out of the way, I got another question for you. And again, if we're going to talk about how to get healing, we got to find out what things are supposed to look like when they're right. And we will review just for a second. We're living in a culture, and it's ever been since, since Genesis chapter 3, and when Lucifer came, that, that serpent of old came and said, did God really say? He's been trying to twist the word of God and get people to doubt the thing. And we live in a culture today, even the New Testament church, there's many churches that do not have a scriptural worldview to the point, quoting it again, 60% of evangelicals polled, I believe it was by Gallup, pure Gallup, uh, who say that Jesus is not the only way to get to heaven. The only way you believe that is because you think this is about religion, not the resurrection. You cannot, if you understand the resurrection, my Lord and my God, as Thomas declared, you can't have, there is no such thing as other religions. You can have a gazillion of them, but it has nothing to do with getting to God because of the resurrection. That's why there's no other name given among men by which they may save, because no one else rose again from the dead. They don't even belong in the discussion. Okay? So once again, going back, and I'm reminded as we're starting now, we'll start uh, get going here. Um, I really, really enjoy my chiropractor. If you don't have a chiropractor, I'm going to highly suggest you go find a good pi- chiropractor. But I'm telling you, there's times, you know, he'll start working up your spine or something like that. He'll hit a spot. And I'm just like, do you work for the CIA in Guantanamo or something? How did you know to hit that? I mean, it just hurts, right? Well, here's the thing. He couldn't make me hurt. He just discovered where I was hurt. The word of God is going to cause you hurt today. You don't get mad at the word of God. Pain is a gift because it lets you know something's wrong. Now, because of the resurrection, we know that's okay. Because if we find out, hey, that's what broke looks like, there's grace and there's healing for restoration and to move on. I was talking to a couple of teenagers today. I was like, pay attention to me today. I'm going to save your life. I'm here to save your marriage. Save your kids. Refresh, renew, heal relationships. Are we hungry and ready to go? All right, let's get going. Okay, just one last time. This service is going to be rated PG-13. Uh, be, when we talk, we're going to be talking about marriage relationships. When things are working right, that means not only are we talking about emotional connections, but we're going to need to talk about physical. What happens when you're married? No, we're not going to have videos and nice pictures and paintings and stuff like that. I'm just letting you know that if you're con- with your children, it's going to be PG-13. And as well as we go and flip the coin, go to the other side. Out of necessity, we're going to need to talk about uh, abuses and how things get broke. And that includes emotional, verbal, even sexual. So I'm going to talk about those things. So here's your last chance. Uh, if your children are in here, and I already told you, I'm not, I have no filter. I'm not going to worry today about delivery. I just want to minister the word of God because I want to help you. I want to help you. And... Uh, My walk with God hasn't been perfect. My marriage hasn't been perfect. My kids haven't been perfect. But we've learned some things. And the word of God is always true. The word of God is always true. I have experience. And we're going to read here in a second how important it is that I have that. So we started out last week 
Quoting 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. And we're going to find out what a stronghold is. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. And we talked about two th- a couple of things. We talked about destruction. We talked about war. We talked about bringing thoughts into captivity to obey Christ. And, and again, I don't want to take the time to spend tons of, of review. Just make sure, go back and watch it. But we, we learned about this attack that has been choreographed, communicated from the 50s, a group of political opponents that want to take down. They love the United States. States, they just don't like the way the United States is right now. All right, and there's choreographed attacks to dismantle Judeo Christian values, and specifically when it comes to morality, decency, and the family. We talked about how even in higher education, the numbers exponentially of liberal progressivism outweighs anybody that would lean toward conservatism. I'm not talking about parties, we're talking about principle. Remember, we vote, we see our world through principle, not a personality. So it's important that you remember that. And I did want to make sure I clarified, I talked to... Um, uh, Dave, can I introduce you? Is it okay? Because right, you know it's on TV, right? Okay. Uh, raise your hand, Dave. Does everybody know who Dave J- Jagodowski is? Okay. Okay. Does anybody, do you guys know what Dave, and uh, Joanna as well, but she doesn't teach, uh, do the same thing. Uh, do you know what he does for a living? Yeah, he's a physics professor at UNH. So he was familiar. I called him when I was on a trip to San Antonio, and I, you know, we talked about what we had talked about. A couple things. Number one, I do want to clarify, because in, as I went through the service, there were, I, I was really happy with about 95% of it. There was about 5%. I want to make sure I clarify. Do you remember when I made the statement, and I said, if your teachers are under 40, they're punks? I want to clarify, if you go back, it's important because he's like, he says, obviously I knew what you were saying. I hope they picked up on it. Go back and see the context. It was about teachers pulling aside seven-year-olds and teaching them they don't have to be boys and girls. In other words, the, the, if you are that, that's who I was referring to. Just like Republican, Democrat, whatever you want to call yourself. There's good Pharisees. Jesus nailed the Pharisees. Nicodemus turned out okay. Okay, so we want to be careful. I want to be very, very careful that that, that was not a universal s- statement. Just be aware. But I stand by the statement. If you're under 40 and you've been indoctrinated to teach our kids this, I will have no problem getting in your face like right now and dealing with you. And so anyway, as I talked to Dave, uh, not this Wednesday, but potentially, we haven't set the date, I asked him on our uh, the Wednesday nights getting together with us on Wednesday, if he would have a conversation with everybody, and that'd be really important for our teenagers and our young adults uh, to listen to what's going on in higher education. All right, and his wife, Joe, she's a professor at, uh, it's here in Manchester, MCC. She's a professor as well, and I've invited her as well if she would be comfortable. And it's not public speaking. It's we're sitting around having coffee, but we have incredible resources here. But we talk now. We talked about there is a combine. Well, combine is more about reaping, but these ideas of morality, which are absolutely 180 degrees out of phase from Judeo-Christian understanding. These things are being shoved down the throat of our culture, our students, higher uh, places of learning, and it's producing. These people are coming out, and they're just spreading these seeds everywhere. And I will throw one thing out, and you can just, just because I like to critically reason, right? AOC just came out. Yeah, I'll call her name. She made two statements. First of all, she's slamming capitalism again. But you know this other, she also came out, she made the statement, and I just want you to think about this, that the world's going to be destroyed like in 17 years if we don't do something about climate change. Whatever the number is, they've been doing this for a while. I just have a quick question. There I, here I go critically thinking again. The world, if we don't do anything, the world's going to be over, I think I heard her say 17 years, 20 years. Do you know what Japan and China right now are doing when it comes to coal? They're building more coal plants. They're building more. Here's my question. Don't they have the same science as we do? 
If the world was over in 17 years, don't you think they might have a sense of urgency as well? If we only have 17 years, I'd like to know why everybody's not losing their minds and shutting down all their planes and all their plants and everything because we're all going to be underwater in 17 years. I'm just saying. Don't let people manipulate you. So we have strongholds, and we talked about the word to destroy because this is what the word of God does. And notice we, this is the apostle Paul, based on the revelations, because Jesus was his personal instructor. He says, I'm taking what he's showing me, and we're breaking down and destroying arguments, lofty opinions. The word destroy means to ruin the structure, organic, ex organic existence, or condition of, to ruin as if by tearing to shreds, to put out of existence, neutralize, annihilate, vanquish. And we did this last week. In other words, God has given us his word to ruin and tear to shreds. His word is meant to ruin and tear to shreds, an idea that a six-year-old girl can decide to be a boy his word is given to tear to shreds that you can have sex with whoever you want wherever you want his word is there to tear to shreds the idea that there are multiple gods and multiple religions his word is to tear to shreds maybe ideas you've had in your marriage that have come in to break it down God forbid doing other things outside of marriage as well. The word is meant to tear to shreds, put out of existence, neutralize, annihilate, and vanquish every idea or philosophy that has been developed to counter the Lord's creation and his ways. This certainly applies to marriage, children, and family. And the last one, this is all I'm doing for review. This is it. And to remind us in Malachi, shorten it up in chapter 2, verse 7. Remember, this is the one where the Lord was talking to the priest. He's talking to Joe Johnson. Okay, those who have accepted the call to stand behind the pulpit and be used to speak on behalf of the Lord himself. And if you remember, he was getting really upset with certain priests because they weren't paying attention to what they were teaching. They were abusing the people. They had no idea what they were talking about. And they were causing people to really backslide, getting some trouble from God. And he said, if you're doing this, all those sacrifices, because you're wondering, why aren't we, how come you're not listening to us and you're sacrificing all your animals? He says, I'm going to take the poop from your sacrifice and I'm going to smear it all over you. That's how angry I am at you abusing my children by not teaching them right. So watch what he's in this. Again, just keep it short because I really got a lot to talk about. The words of a priest's lips should preserve knowledge of God and people should go to him for instruction. And again, I said it last week. I'm here primarily for you, not Oprah. Too much theology is being developed. Even Dr. Phil is a psychologist. He's not a theologian. I am. Right? And they're not your pastor. And if I'm not your pastor, whatever, there's really good pastors out there. Find one because you got, you're supposed to have somebody that you can primarily go to and find out how does the God stuff work. And he's supposed to know. <laughs> Notice, people should go to him for instruction, but the priest is the messenger of the Lord of heaven's armies. But you priests have left God's path. Your instructions have caused many to stumble into sin. Which means if I'm doing my job, you do what you want. I'm not here to run your life. I, could care. I have enough time, hard time at times, dealing with my own life. And so do not leave here going, wow, Pastor Joe's just judging me. He's trying to run my life. No, I'm not. I'm just giving you the information so you can make your own decisions. Don't shoot the messenger. But you can't make your decisions if the messenger isn't telling you the truth. Right? And if I am uh, a messenger of the Lord of Heaven's armies, <laughs> you think about how big this like, organization is I'm a part of. I'm not big enough to change what he wrote. I don't know enough to change what he wrote. I've only had poquito otherworldly visitations. I have seen the Lord once. That was cool. You don't stand up very long. So I've had some things, not near what we're going to, but I can't match that, which means if I, if I don't know what it's like on that level to be hanging out with legions of angels, the last thing I'm going to do is take that book and twist it around so that you're not as mad at me as you would have if I just told you the truth. 
You ready? Let's get to work. Okay, so this is where we ended last week, and so let's talk about, remember, one coin, two sides. Let's begin to talk about you can't have a broken heart if we don't know what it's like when things are working right. So God created man, Genesis chapter 1, 27 through 28. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them, and God blessed them. A couple things. First of all, male and female, whose idea was this? Okay, if it's God's idea, then does the government, a psychologist, a overly wealthy doctor who makes tons of money selling drugs that changes hormones, should any of those people have any right at all to define what male and female is? No, why? Because of the resurrection and because it says God did this. Well, I was, and people say, well, I'm just born in the wrong body. No, you're believing a lie. God, you're fearfully and wonderfully made. You know, there's thoughts you're never supposed to have. Eve was never supposed to listen. You're going to have stuff that comes, and God forbid now you got all school systems that are putting this in kids' minds. And I'll say it again this week. Listen, if you've got, and when we get to sexual abuses and stuff like that, I, I, I was sexually abused. I was. And I, myself, or anybody else, I can't think of anybody that looks back when they were eight years old and they had whatever happened to them going, you know, that was just the greatest thing that ever happened to me. Boy, I'm so glad at eight years old, man, I got touched. I'm so glad when I was eight, I was shown this image. I'm so glad. No, it gets in your head, man. And an eight-year-old has no business having a governor or some teacher start pulling them aside and telling them those things. You are a child abuser, and I'll tell you that 24-7. Now, when they're 18, if they want to go do some stuff, now, actually, in the Jewish faith, you were a little bit younger when you started crossing over and they considered you an adult, but don't be telling me no six-year-old kid needs to be learning how to touch themselves. That stuff has been going on in California for a long time. You're sexually abusing children. You're an abuser, and you need to be called out on it. And I'm doing it. So God created male and female. And look, when he got done, he goes like, and God blessed them. So right now we're finding what works, what's not broke, is that our creator determines masculinity, femininity, which chromosome goes into which one. And when he got done, he's so happy with the creation, he blessed him, presupposing if we understand his definitions, then we'll experience his blessing. And at the end of the day, this is what the enemy wants. He wants to come and twist the word of God so much, and not just how you walk in faith, but principles. If you're not walking based on his designs, then the opportunity to be blessed is going to be limited, probably non-existent. And that's what the enemy wants. And then what you do is you come up with doctrines to make up for your failures. And you become general editors of the Word of God. How many of you ever heard this saying before? <laughs> what I want to do is I specifically, and you know I've, sp I've spent a lot of time working on specific slides, not just that I can read, but so that you can take pictures. I'm going to talk about some things today. I'm going to make, do you remember when you were a kid? How many of y'all remember? Maybe the younger kids didn't do it. How many of y'all remember when you were in school and your teacher said, okay, put your thinking caps on. <laughs> Let's put our thinking caps on. All right. Because what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about the science of how God creates. And by the time we're done, we're going to clarify and make clear the reason for why God expects what he expects with men, women, marriage, masculinity, femininity, all of these things. And we don't have to go any farther than, and you're going to get a lesson on this, we don't have to go any farther if we understand how God functions, the Trinity. If we understand how God, there is no other God. God is them and him. And you can understand, by the time you're done, we're going to understand that. What the, what does that have to do with marriage? Everything, because the marriage is the marriage relationship is a mirror of how the Trinity exchanges with one another. 
That's why he said this mystery is great. However, I speak of Christ and his church. You're going to find out this whole marriage thing you got going on is a whole lot more than you getting married, sleeping with someone, and making babies and growing old and fat together. I told you I had no filter. Don't get offended at me. But I'm going to give you some things, and I want to take some time, because it, once we understand how God processes, God the Father, God the Son, whom we know is Jesus, God the Holy Spirit, God, when we understand their relationship and how they're one and how they're equal and yet how they're different, and all that's going to make sense here in just a minute, you'll stand back and we'll see the verses, and we're going to go... That's why that upsets him so much. That's why. Because of what he wants us to understand. So follow science. This is real science we're going to talk about. Okay? So here we go. We don't need to go any farther than this, the most well-known section in the New Testament about how marriage works. Husbands and wife and what he's thinking. We don't even get to what the kids are supposed to do yet, but I'm sure I'll be able to squeeze you guys right in. Ephesians 5, 21 through 33. And further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. For wives, this means. See, I love the word of God. So he's going to say, and you got people that abuse these verses. Well, you just need to submit. You just need to do this. Notice he said, we're each submit. I'm going to submit to my wife. You're going to submit to me. And I love how the word of God goes. Okay, what I mean is, women, this is what this means. But guess what? In a second, he's going to go, men, this is what that means to you. So let's pay attention. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of his wife as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of his body, the church. And as the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. Say everything. everything. Does that leave anything out? By the way, by the time I'm get done, and as I was getting ready for bed last night, I was reviewing like Gloria Steinem, who I don't know if you know worked for the CIA. Okay, her and Betty Friedan and these uber women's liberal crazy activists. Did you know if you followed the word of God, a woman would never follow women's lib. You guys have it so good. Yes, I do. The, the word of God empowers women. The word of God, you, things are so good for you. All right, you are empowered, you're enabled, you're recognized. You don't have that in these other religions. I don't see any Christian in here with your face covered. I don't see anybody getting their head cut off because you taught something from the pulpit or Sunday school. Let alone hung out with the apostles and the prophets and aided them in their ministry. Okay? God elevate, he exalts his creation, both men and women. Now, I have a question for you. Notice, and this is, I'm only, I'm just giving you a little teaser here. Notice, uh, wives, submit to your husbands in everything. I got a question. Is there Jesus without a father? You don't have a son without a father. Which mean, you, pastor, you mean to tell me where we're going to go is we're going to find out that Jesus does the same thing with the father that wives do with their husbands, and maybe you shouldn't be so upset about that verse now. For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. You, when we get done today, you may get so blessed you're going to send this thing out to all your friends because I'm willing to bet you probably haven't heard some of the angles we're going to go at today. It's not new, just I have my own particular way. And I know it's going to help you. Okay? Love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. After all, no one ever hated their own body. But they feed and they care for... Yeah, see, that's what I was doing. I was caring for my body. Just, <laughs> just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. And for this reason... who We're going to spend a bunch of time on this. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother. Well, pastor, you know what? I'm not even married. You need to pay attention to this. You need to pay attention because you know there's guidelines in your behavior before you're married. And I'm going to prove to you why when you violate them, you make a serious, 
egregious error because of these verses on marriage. And be united to his wife, the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. So where we're going to go, and we're going to read another verse. How many of y'all familiar, and we'll read it here in a second, what the Apostle Paul had to say about what the creation does when it comes to God's invisible attributes? There's nothing random in God, whether it's how marriages work or how the universe runs. His entire creation is a chalkboard for us to understand invisible truths. He illustrates how he thinks and how he processes through the marriage relationship <coughs> and activity, and as well, the heavens and the earth declare the glory of God. Everything he creates says, look at this and you'll learn something about me. And this is why the Apostle Paul, this is why the Word of God says, everybody's without excuse. All you need to do is look at a hummingbird, sit there and float three feet in front of your face and go... There's no way that something, a lightning bolt hitting a pond scum could make that thing do that. And now they're scientists. I forget their name, Yale, Harvard, and all that. One of them quoted, uh, Darwin was a beautiful theory, but it's mathematically impossible. <laughs> it's mathematically impossible. So, I want to read a couple verses here, and let's talk about, remember, we're following the science. Pastor, what does that have to do about my first kiss and what I want to do with my girlfriend next? Everything. What does this have to do? I've been married 25 years. I'm kind of bored, and this and this is happening. And it just kind of was. It has everything. Because when we get this, so let's watch. Oh, look, there's Romans right there. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. His creation itself, all of it, are lessons by which we can understand God's power, his glory, now he functions. Now let's, let's take a look at this. Because remember, what's marriage? Marriage, he's speaking of Christ and the church. It's an illustration of the body of Christ and how the second person of the Godhead sees us. And, ultimately, and for the lack of time, I'm just not going back to Genesis. But that's another lesson maybe we'll get into in a couple weeks. Speaking of Jesus, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power. Notice, his creation teaches us how God works, how he thinks, what he has us do, our activities, in this case we're talking about marriage, and now, and why we needed to go to this, okay, marriage, family, marriage is supposed to be Christ in the church, okay, Christ in the church, okay, let's break this down as simple as we can, Christ in the church, okay, I kind of got me figured out as the church, let's talk about Christ, he is the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, in other words, there is nothing Zero, not an atom within Jesus Christ that is any less of who the Father is. Well, pastor, okay, is there anything in creation that will help me understand that? You are in good fortune. Because there is. And now we're going to start helping you understand the Trinity. God. He's the only God. And this will explain everything on marriage and relationships. So if we're use this creation to teach us his invisible attributes, the light does not originate the sun. Okay? Right now, look outside. Light. Is light making the sun real? No, light does not originate the sun. It's the other way around. Now watch. Yet the sun is not known without light. 
The sun, though light does not originate the sun, you cannot know there's a sun without light. The sun and light share the same natures and yet at the very same time are interdependent of each other. We see then that the light originates from the sun and in that the sun is the originator. By the way, you're finding out why wives submit to your husbands as the man submits to Christ and as one day Christ is going to submit all things to the Father. I'm breaking down mysteries for you guys to understand how you can be equal and yet still orderly. And in that the Son is the originator and in this is the authority over the light. You've got no light without the Son, but you have no discovery of the Son without the light. Remember, He uses His creation to teach us how He works. Yet the sun is dependent on the light to reveal and make itself known. And I just got to say this as we keep going. I just put this, this was last minute because I'm just so blown away by how good God is. The Trinity is beautiful. Incomprehensibly beautiful. And this principle, these, there shouldn't be hard to understand, and yet understanding this love and exchange each has for the other will make the understanding of his or her creation simple. Can a being be a father if it's not fathering? No. Can a child or a son be a child if it is not the offspring of? No. So now what we have is we have the, the Lord Jesus. He says, Father, I thank you that you have loved me from before the foundation of the world. The Father is not, cannot be discovered by creation without the express image of his person coming out of him. So, of course, if he's the express image, there can be nothing diminished in the light that's proceeding forth out of the Father. It can't be any diminished or he can't be the express image of. So here the father is is allowing the life of his second person to come out of him and exist. And the Holy Spirit is none less than the very nature and power of the father exchanged through the son. And now if you can get a hold of this, we have the same spirit that the father has been pouring in and through the son forever and ever and ever. And this has everything to do with your marriage. And I'm going to prove it to you. The very instant we understand these things, the mysteries of male and female, husband and wife, who has authority over who, will become as clear as the eyeglasses you just cleaned the smudge off of. There is order and there's authority But for all those women's movements, well, just women are oppressed. Women are oppressed. Religion oppresses them. God is so unfair. Those Christian men, they're so mean, all they want to do is have sex and party all night. And go and do whatever they want while the women are barefoot in the kitchen and pregnant. Not according to modeling after the Trinity. He said, the mister is great. I'm speaking of Christ and the church. More science lessons. Now let's start talking about marriage. And from the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made a woman and brought her to him. For God made Adam first, and afterward he made Eve. Then, when all things are under his authority, the Son will put himself under God's authority, so that God, who gave his Son authority over all things, will be utterly supreme over everything everywhere. So now we have to talk, let's start talking about marriage. Because wives, you know, you just need to submit to your husbands. Well, now we're finding out that this has very little to do with the husband stepping all over you. Just as... The Father, Jesus proceeds out of the Father. 
and the Lord's going to submit himself even to the Father. This is the grounds. This is why he rightfully says, women, submit to your husbands. We were first. You proceeded out of us. As the sun proceeds out of the, uh, as light proceeds out of the sun, as Jesus is constantly being expressed out of the bosom of the Father, ladies, you we were first. You were taken out. But remember, you came out of us. Yes, we were first. But you're a helpmate, and the word helpmate comparable means listen. There's rank, but not inequality. Authority does not mean inequality. And that's what the enemy wants to do is he wants to get into marriages. He wants to turn this thing into an inequality thing instead of, remember, we're submitting to, every, to each of us. We're submitting to one another. All right, here's your notes. Eve proceeded out of the man as Jesus is expressed and proceeds forth from the being of the father. It is for this reason that the husband unequivocally has authority in the marriage relationship. As it is the Lord's greatest pleasure to bring honor to the Father as he fully reflects the glory of the Father, in the same way it is the Father's joy to always give everything to the Son. This union and relationship and mutual honor is the one and only model and guide for which marriage and Christian relationships must be guided by. Let's keep going. Science. Maleness is life-giving, femaleness is life-receiving. In the same way that Jesus ever lives and unceasingly releases his life, now I'm talking about your marriage, his life into his creation, a man has a continuous and overwhelming desire to give life to his wife. For the woman to say with disdain all he wants is sex is to ignore that maleness is driven by otherworldly powers to give its life in the same way that Jesus in his maleness does to his creation. Men are wired to give their life. Sexually and physically. Where our master ever lives as the father is issuing his life into his son, now into his creation. Remember, Jesus upholds all things by the word of his power. There is constantly energy and life coming out of him to maintain his creation. And as life givers, men, we're the ones that carry seed. Women, I love you, but you get no baby without us. You de No baby. There's no children without now. I get that. Listen, ladies, you're going to get your turn in a second. Promise. <laughs> Equal opportunity church here. But women, wives, and men, even before you're married, this is why you just, it's part of, you want to conquer your world, you want to conquer your job, but by the time you're 13, 14, you just want to get laid. Well, pastor, should you use that term? Listen, I like the term. I just think it's so great to make love. Sometimes I don't want to make love. I want to get laid, and I don't want to pray in tongues when I'm done. I want to pass out. <laughs> Got some thumbs up from the men there. <laughs> Bill Maher isn't the only one that should be talking about this, nor should Dr. Phil. I'm your pastor, and you ought to have a pastor secure enough of himself. But see, now I had to go through that because now we're going to start, we're talking science. This is why, and this is why testosterone is such a raging drug. <laughs> testosterone is our friend. Ma uh, uh, toxic masculinity is a term used by the enemy to shut down male aggressiveness because we are meant, under the auspices of the Word of God, of course, to pour out and give our physical and our emotional lives for our generation and specifically to our wives. Well, I just don't feel like having sex. Isn't it funny? I've run into women. You're going to get your turn, I promise this is why there's no kids in here. It amazes me 
how many re- marriage relationships where the wives just, you know, they use their bodies again. Do you know you are commanded by the word of God to give it up? Yeah. <laughs> You're commanded. It's not your body. And why are you supposed to give it over to your husband? So Satan can't come in and tempt hey, You want to? I'm thinking of even preachers that did some really dark things, but you can look and somewhere down the line, their wives shut them down. That's not an excuse. I'm talking science. But I want us to understand, okay, women, you can get excited. It's about to be your turn. I'm gonna, we're going to get them. But men, I want you to understand why you are so driven. And I'm not going to call it toxic masculinity. You're being just like the second person of the Godhead. He ever lives to express his life. It's part of maleness to give life. Maleness is life giving, females is life receiving. In the same way the Lord's creation is a womb, so to speak, always conditioned to receive what he is working and giving at that moment. That without me you can do nothing is just another way of saying nothing gets done without a receiving of Jesus. The husband must understand our wives are in constant need and desire necessitated by the very laws of creation itself for us to saturate them with our love and attention and adoration. As much as you must give life, they must receive life. They must be saturated with your adoration, with your love and your care, which means sometimes you're not going out drinking with your buddies. Amen. Which means you're going to come home from work and you're going to take a shower. And by the way, when you start having dinner, oh, honey, just look what I gave you. And it takes two hands to hold the rock that you just bought for her to put on her ring. <laughs> because you want to adorn her. You want to bless her. And husbands, I'll just tell you, and look, I'm not getting into the whole menopause thing and stuff like that. We're not, you, well, no, because you, I can only talk about so much. So like, you got to just stay in context with me, right? Because we know there's stuff out there. But I'm just saying, men, you treat your queen like a queen. You treat your queen like a queen. She's got a new dress, new clothes. And it doesn't mean, and you don't have to have a lot of money. To, I remember we were, we were so broke one time, was it Mother's Day or Valentine's Day? And I'm like, what am I going to get her? And so you know what I did? What I did was, I know, you know those um, uh, notepads, you know, with the lines on them or like that? I cut out with scissors a flower and colored in with magic marker and said, I love you. She still, <laughs> almost gives me a tear. She said she still has that. And men, we've been warped in our thinking of what it means to have our wives submit to us. Because we have our own submission that we have to do. Every, Jesus does not take his mind in, his, in maleness. It never crosses his mind to stop blessing and pouring out his life. It never crosses his mind. And if you were married, it should never cross your mind to not constantly be considering how can I saturate my wife with love and adoration and gifts and flowers, all the things that a king would give his queen. Queens don't mind hanging out with their kings if the kings are like fun to be around. It is this very science that causes God to use the word abomination when it comes to homosexuality. There may be no more blatant affront to the order of his creation than that. If you have two women together, you have no life giver. If you have two men together, then you have no womb. And it's, a fr- it's an affront. And listen, I've done things that are affront. Don't leave this service. As a matter of fact, I'm not even going to explain myself. I'm so tired of having to explain myself. You all know where I'm coming from. I hate all myself. Cut the garbage, man. I'm explaining to you the science of why there are some things that seem to really frost him. 
Because now we're talking about design of creation, maleness, femaleness, and what they're supposed to produce. We get to go even deeper. Are you guys still with me? Ephesians 5.31, because of this, a man will leave his father and mother and join to his wife. The two will become one flesh. We're talking about science now, right? Okay, teenagers, I'm going to save your life. Some of you young adults, different things. Remember, oh, and I want you to remember my chiropractor. He just, everything's fine until you hit a button. You get sore. Don't get mad at me. You're sore because you're right. You need an adjustment. The model, it does. It's called repentance. <laughs> because of this, a man will, so here's the model. Okay, I got parents. I left them. She had parents. She left him. If I can put this out there, I have seen even marriages destroyed because mom and dad didn't know how to keep their mouth shut and stay out of their kids' marriage. Amen. And it produces men without testicles, and it produces women that run the household because they know they can always go back to mommy or daddy. To my grandparents' credit, I found out when they, well, I was. Um, my mom, my mom was pregnant before they were married and things were going hard and she ran home and I can't remember if it was grandma or grandpa said, you're going to work it out. You get back to your husband's house. Don't come to us for help. Okay. You left your father and your mother. You've joined with your wife. The two of you are now one flesh. You've left the authority. You honor does not necessarily mean you're submitted to anymore. I honor my mother and father, but I'm not submitted to my father anymore. And the two, and we're just gonna, here's a thread, the two will become one flesh. So when they join, and it's not just the physical joining, emotionally there's this growth to where you literally, and here, this theme of union is throughout Genesis through Revelation. So here's the model. Okay. In in the Lord's definitions, who gets to join physically? The husband and the wife. The husband and the wife, right? Do you want to know why he's like that? I'm going to show you. When we decide to have sexual relationships outside of marriage, it is the same as saying I'm willing to use you, but I'm not willing to fully commit to you. I got that one 2 days ago praying in tongues. And I'm going to leave that there. And we got adults in this church. I told you, I love you. I'm not going to judge you. You can be part of this. I'm not one of those guys that wants people leaving the church. and stuff. I just, I don't do that. I've never been like that. But if you're having sexual relationships outside of your marriage, you are saying to the, to the woman or the woman saying to the guy, I'll use you. I'm willing to use you and let you use me. But because I don't want to get married, I'm not willing to fully commit to you. Let me ask you this, and you'd say, uh, you know, pastor, you're kind of getting pretty personal with this stuff, aren't you? Not really. Under the old covenant, do you know how they found, do you, do you know what the priests would do after the wedding was consummated? Yeah. What'd they do? They went and make sure there was blood on the sheet. See, if when, you're a, when a woman's a virgin and the man and the woman come together, that blood seals a covenant. And I'm just telling you, if you're not a virgin, you allowed your, the blood of a covenant to go on to some other man that you may not even ever see again. This is huge to God. This is so huge to him. Because, again, Christ in the church, this is the mystery, we keep bringing it back. Our God within the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit continually are devoted and exchange their love with one another without compromise, and we have been invited to experience that same relationship with one another and with Him. And they are comp the father wouldn't think of going, you know what? I don't want to pour forth my son anymore. The son would never, Jesus would never think, you know what? I'm tired of making the old man look so good. You would never have that. But I'll remind, and I'll, I, this came to my heart, but I will remind you. I remember talking to the Lord one time, and I'm like, you know what? I can be such an idiot sometimes. 
you probably never said that to God. And this is what he said to me. He said, he said and I, I think I've shared this with you. He said, son, I know how much you lost in Adam. I know what spiritual death has done to your race. I know how blind you guys are. And that's why he extends grace. That's why today there's grace. We all get to start again. All right? But we're, 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 we're pressing things because, listen, if you want to carry, if we want to carry the power of God, we don't get to pick and choose which one of his principles we like and what we don't like. And if you're having a relationship outside of your marriage, I trust you still love me, but I'm challenging you to look that man or that woman in the eye and go, you know what? I'm either ready to say, you're mine for the rest of my life. Let's get going. Let's start making plans. Or I'm not going to dis uh, disrespect you by using your body anymore because I'm not really to give really give you all that I am the way God does within himself this is why God despises adultery and fornication see I'm explaining to you those verses now you're seeing the sign the reasonableness for why he's like, you don't do this now that you're sons of God. You don't live like this. Now I'm taking it out of, and you're in good fortune because now maybe for the first time in your life, instead of someone saying, repent, you sinner, I'm breaking it down for you so that you can understand why he's saying those things and really to give evidence of the reasonableness and wisdom behind it. Because as we get ready to finish up and now start going to things that are broke, the, we're carrying brokenness because we've had people reject us. They've molested us. They've used us for their own designs. I can't tell you how many ladies, unfortunately, you thought you gave it up and the guy loved you and two months later he's now gone and you got holes in your heart right now. You wouldn't have the hole if you would have just paid attention to his word. He loves us. And again, if, there, if things are being poked, it's not because, and I'm not, listen, I know some of you guys very, I know, and I love you. And I don't know what else to do to make it so that you know I'm not going after anybody. I heard this a long time ago. Uh, Bro Kenneth Hagin said this. He says, never aim the word of God. Let the Holy Spirit talk. I don't aim. I'm not aiming at anybody. I'm explaining husband and wife relationships and what it's like before your husband and wife. And why? Because, listen, you can't read through the New Te Old Testament, but especially the New Testament, where he doesn't deal with adultery and fornication and all these other things. I'm showing you why it's a big deal. It's not about having fun. So what's the common thread we see through this? And this is the last section. Other side of the coin. There's three verses. Because of this, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become how much flesh? One. Okay. And at that day, Jesus said, talking to his disciples, in that day you will know that I am in my father, you are in me, and I in you. I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. Common thread of his creation, connection, and unwavering commitment. Union, union and unity. That you would maintain the what of the spirit in the bond of peace? Unity of the spirit. Ladies, I need you to all, I want you to all think and have the same mind. But notice we are created for connection. And I, there's so, uh, it's a seminar, but I'm going to talk about one word. And this is what we're going to be praying for today. If I could sum up lack of connection and things that cause that into one word. Now that we understand how the very fabric of the Lord's creation is maintained, we can understand the unspeakable pain we experience when these things are violated. The pain of broken relationships, no matter the means, can debilitate us for life if we do not both experience healing 
and grant forgiveness to the ones that have violated us. One word. The severing of our of union, we can sum it up into one word. Rejection. If we have sex before we're married, we reject the dignity of the other by refusing to unconditionally commit for the rest of our lives to the value and caring of the other person. I'm rejecting you. You think I'm having fun? I'm actually rejecting you. Because you're not. I'm deciding you are not worthy of my total commitment yet. But I'll still use you. If we are unfaithful to our spouse, we have rejected them for another. And the longer we've been married, the more devastating the wound. When we verbally, physically, or sexually abuse someone, we are rejecting their dignity as a gift that God himself has created and died for to redeem. A wholesome tongue, these are... These are ways that, these are the most common ways we get wounds in our heart. I talked about different actions. Let's talk about something else. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. Say break. break. Can you come up with a sound? Snap. Crack. Okay, good, because you're going to help me. When you don't know how to use your words right, because remember, we're meant, for, we're meant for connection. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The only place we're going to start working on, and I've been sharing with folks, I want you to think about this. How many of you all had breakfast this morning? Did you have breakfast? Okay. Your body was fed because it ate food. Okay? There's our body. Our spirit. How do we feed our spirit? Our spirit needs to eat. How do, how do we feed our spirit? Sure, through the word of God, my words are spirit and they are life. What else we can do? We can pray, pray in the Holy Ghost so we can feed our spirit. All right, now we got something else we got to talk about, and that's the soul. May your whole spirit, soul, and body. Okay, who can give me the simple definition of what our soul is? There's really three compartments you'll hear normally. Soul. What is it? Your, your, uh, your intellect, mm -hmm. your emotions, mm -hmm. and your will. Yeah, mind, will, and emotions. Okay. Anybody in here smart? <laughs> you, you know some facts and figures? You got some. Okay, so your intellect, the part of the soul, you fed. Okay. Will, I know most of you, and you have no problem feeding your will. You do whatever you want, whenever you want. <laughs> Matter of fact, your will's pretty big, stout. For many of us, our intellect, our mind is pretty full. But the one part we don't talk a lot about when it comes to the soul is our emotions and connection. Emotional connections and relationship with people. Okay? You don't get any more connected than Jesus being in the Father, the Father in Him, and Him in us. You're not supposed to get any more connected than a husband and wife being in union physically and emotionally with one another. What we've done in Western culture, because we're very Greek in our thinking, in other words, we, 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 we use our brain to assess information, and many of us are out of touch with our emotions. Therefore, that part of our soul, as much as you can be beefy here and pray in tongues and be beefy in the Spirit, you can be a P-O-W when it comes to emotional health and strength. And I'm submitting today that there's a lot of folks that are emaciated. They haven't had emotional connection in years. With their husbands, with their wives, with their friends. And if that is not fed, we're going to be crippled. And what I want to do is I want to show you a couple ways to where rejection and lack of connection. Now, what I want you to do with me is I want you to go, snap. Let's do that. Snap. Okay, that's the sound of something breaking, right? Someone who uses their words wrong snaps the spirit, right? I wonder if we can come up with some examples. Mom and dad, I hate you. Snap. 
You're never going to amount to anything. I wish you weren't ever born. Snap. Can't you just lose some weight? Snap. All you want is sex. Snap. Ladies, I'm on your side. I want you to have diamond rings so big it reminds me of Fred Flintstone when they bought those big ribs out and it tipped his whole car. I want you to have that, okay? I'm right there for you. But ladies, in our masculinity, we're driven to give life. It's in our nature to give our life. Emotionally and sexually. How come the Joneses have more than we do? Snap. I want to talk about when I was a kid, 10 to 12. I got us out here before 12. I'll be able to do the same thing, and then we'll just pray for people. And just as a parent now, I want to share just a couple things that I've experienced. And um, I I mentioned before earlier some abuse that's taken place. Um, I was, when those things happened, I was rejected, and I still work through things. I have a very difficult time trusting anybody. And where I want to go is, and we had some things happen about three years ago, where I was, I was outright rejected. Okay? And what I want you to do is I want you to learn this from me because we're going to, but when we pray for you, there's people in here that need your forgiveness and you need to forgive them. Now, I want to clarify. I, I have never, ever believed in someone going, well, you just need to forgive them. I don't believe that's true. Let me clarify. Uh, Vanessa, mm-hmm. okay? I just think you should get down and give me 50 push-ups right now. Can you do 50 push-ups? No. Okay. But is there a process you can begin so that one day you just might be able to? Okay. One of the things, it's too easy to just go, well, why can't you just forgive them? Well, because I can't. But that doesn't mean I'm not going to grow to where one day I can. There's some wounds, man, that are so deep. They're so ingrained even to your very nature and just say, well, Pastor, why don't you just forgive that guy? I can't. But I'm going to. Because I know what I need to do to walk out the word of God so that the day comes, I'm free. I'm free. And what's happened, some of you, you're carrying your wounds because someone just said, well, and and you're going nuts. She could be going nuts. I want to do 50 push-ups. She can't. But if she gets around somebody and goes, let's start with two. How about we just look at one scripture, what Jesus had to say about forgiveness. Let's just, let's just think about that for a moment. Oh, okay, I think I can do that. All right. Maybe we'll just talk about one verse. You're, you're, you're the righteousness of God in Christ. He forgives all your sins. How about, matter of fact, why don't we start remembering that he forgives you? See, we're just so easy. We just want to flip people. And what happens when I, if I was to do that to you, Why don't you just forgive them? You can't right now. And so what I'm doing is I'm forcing you to get into a crazy cycle you're never going to succeed on. And now you're going to get even more bitter because you know you're supposed to forgive. You can't, so you won't. And now you're miserable not just at them, you're miserable at yourself. And now you're twice as bad as you were just after the offense. So why don't we agree, like when we pray for you tonight, I'm, to this morning, I'm not going to sit there, you just need to pray. Father, I thank you there's grace to start that journey that they're going to be free one day. Amen. And yes, you're going to start going, I forgive them by faith. I forgive them. I forgive them. No, you don't. No, I do. I forgive them. No, you don't. I was just about to mention a couple of their names. I forgive them. No, you don't. Not really. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. And the reason why I'm saying that is because my faith is taking on actions. I don't feel any different. 
And if I took a two by four and hit you across the head, listen, you can forgive me all you want. It's still going to hurt like hell because you just got your head caved in. And there's wounds that are so deep. Do not expect the pain to go right away. That's another thing Christians just come up with. These are real wounds. When someone has surgery, those are real wounds. And there isn't a doctor on the planet. Now, I remember I got my appendix taken out. You get your butt out of bed and start walking. Huh? That hurts. Okay. So and that's what I'm talking about. Father, I just thank you. I forgive him. Voice, no, you don't. Remember it. Know how you feel? doesn't matter. I, forget. I just start walking. Recovery is never painless. Unless you have a working of miracles. Those are always cool. But it seems he gets a lot more out of us when he does the recovery exercise thing rather than the instant thing. Right? And I talked to my dad, and I'll talk to your parents as well, so I shared a little bit of that and, and working through stuff. Um, and I, I called my, and my dad and I are, were all good, and he said he was sorry and, and stuff, but I wanted to give an example to parents that have children. And I was talking about a wholesome tongue as a tree of life. And this was an event that took place. I was in high school, and I was just starting to um, learn how to play guitar. And um, a gentleman, my friend's name was Brian, and he'd been playing a little bit longer than I have. And so, and I want you to, as parents to know what happens to your children when things like this happen. And you want to get on stuff right away. And again, Dad and I are all good. He, this is not any issues anymore. But here I was in high school. I was already dealing with crap because when I was in sports, I was the star pitcher and I was the star quarterback. I had trophies. I was the one, the MVPs and all that. Until once we got in the middle middle school, everybody grew up and got bigger than me. And I couldn't keep up with basketball. I couldn't keep up. With, I just couldn't keep up. All right. And I was embarrassed. We grew up in a family of sports, and you know, Dad was the star track and the football thing and all that, and it was great being the star, but then it really stunk when I wasn't big enough to play anymore. So I decided to fall in love with chess and music. Okay, So I already have this in my soul that I'm not doing what I think our family wants. I'm embarrassed. All right? I'm embarrassed from the things the sports teams used to say to me because I went from being really, really good to the different things they'd make fun of me of. So I'm going to pick up something that I'm going to want to do. So my friend Brian's over, and we're playing, and he's playing, and we're playing. And, uh, and um, parents just pay attention, right? And again, it's all good. But my dad complimented my friend on how great his guitar playing was, and he didn't say a word to me. Now, my dad is constantly praising me now. Like, that is not a problem. He didn't even know Jesus. None of us did. But you know what that did? Well, Pastor Joe, you're so competitive. You want to know where a lot of that comes? A lot of that's not necessarily healthy. It's because I just figure you're going to reject me anyway, so I might as well beat you to a pulp and just leave you in the dust and go ahead and beat you and just succeed while you suck. And there's a lot of characteristics that people have in their lives are not healthy. They didn't get there because it's the right thing. They got there because they're compensating. And if you're compensating, you're not being genuine, certainly before God. Now, he uses them. Okay, I'm okay with being competitive now because it's not coming from a bad thing. But I had in me, okay, if he's a better guitar player than me, then at one point in music, how long, how many hours a day did I play? Because I was going to be the best. If I learned to fly, I was going to be the best. I'm going to beat you. But it wasn't because it was necessarily a great trait. It came from something that happened years ago. He wouldn't have had any idea that was happening. Parents, you may not have known what's happening, but there's snaps going on potentially. You got a bunch of snaps going on in your family right now, and I'm letting you know, pay attention. And if you got to say some sorry, start getting some sorries out there because here's the thing. It doesn't matter emotionally how weak your child, your marriage may be. Just like any other diet, you 
can start feeding that and people can get healthy again. The, oh, the, today, before the Super Bowl, I'd make it a goal to take 10 instances where you use your mouth and you speak life into your children. Speak life into your family. Let them know how much you love them, you care for them. I'm so glad you're here. I'm so sorry I said what I said to you. I must, I must have absolutely crushed you when I did that to you. Sweetheart, I must have crushed you when I said, <laughs> no, uh, no, it's okay. Because I don't think I did it. No, I would say let's exercise, but I'll, I'll just use it. I must have crushed you if I ever said, you know what, you're fat. I never said you're fat. Tell me. Okay, I was just waiting. I didn't want to say, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sweetheart, I must have crushed you when I said, I don't want to have sex with you tonight. You're too dirty. I don't have time. You don't deserve it. And see what we have, and then now it's after we have to be done because we're done. I want to pray, but I'll pick it up next week. Our marriages, I'll sum it up here. Our marriages and certainly our parenting, as much as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have unconditional exchange and love, that's the way we're supposed to be. Our children have to know unconditional love, not you're happy because they got the A. And if we're raising families like that, then it's going to be nearly impossible to understand a God that does not look at you that way. It'll be very difficult for you to understand forgiveness is all you knew is conditional love. I demonstrate my love for you because you made me happy right now. And the Father in heaven loves us even when we don't make him happy. And we can't grasp that unless we cultivate and make a culture. This is Pastor Joe again, and I trust that you enjoyed our service. I believe that you learned more about God, you learned more about His kingdom, that you understand more of His word. And at the end of the day, what makes that amazing is we can walk more close with our God and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So if there's anything we can do to serve you, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Of course, our Sunday morning services are at 10 o'clock. Our information is on the website. Please make sure you check it out. And I'm going to look forward to seeing you, serving you, journeying together with you in this generation to see the goodness of God now and forever and ever. God bless you. I look forward to seeing you real soon.